How is everyone today? <laughs> Feeling worried about another discussion about fear? Yes, no? Feeling afraid about my fear? Bring it on, brother. Um, oh, we just want to close this uh, door here. So, uh, in this session, if you have to go out to, to the toilets or anything, please go around the side doors so that uh, so that the front door here can be remain closed. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank those that were here yesterday and also during the month for your donations that you've sent to us. Uh, that's been really good. It's actually meant that we can actually start. There's a, a few things that we had to do around the place that were getting pretty bad, so we've been able to use some of those funds to do some things around the place, which has been good. And also, um, quite a lot of the things that we're trying to do now um, in terms of worldwide, in terms of getting the truth out there, can start to be done too, because we're having to host a website now and a few other things that are a bit more costly to do. So your funds have enabled us to do some of that. And um, also, as you know, in the past we've had some trouble with our sound systems and so forth. And so we're looking at spending a bit of the money that you've donated on actually getting some a bit better sound equipment so that we can use it here and also when we're on the road. So, so that's great. So thank you so much for those donations. Um, the other thing was that uh, we just wanted to say to everyone that uh, after the session today, um, if, if you could pile up your chairs, I think it's nine high or ten high, ten high, um, so that we can easily clean up and move the chairs away, that would be good to remember at the end of the session, because usually at the end of the session I forget to say it, so, so I thought I'd better say it now. Um, you want to say a few housekeeping, housekeeping things? Fire away, babe. Hi, everyone. Um, we just wanted to say that if anyone had a spare half an hour at the end, um, it would be lovely to have some volunteers to help out Soraya in the kitchen. Um, so if you can see Soraya. And for future as well, if um, people don't mind arriving a little bit earlier and helping laying out the chairs, Sven and Karen, I can't find them. Oh, there's Karen. And Sven there. <laughs> um, usually in charge of that job. So if you see them, um, they can direct you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Do you want to mention the party too? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Anna has, uh, Anna and Peter have kindly offered this venue to us if we want to have a party. Um, so we want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it won't be only those of you coming, it will be also you can invite friends and so forth. Obviously uh, there might be a few little a few little guidelines with regard to alcohol and a few things like that. But uh, what we'd like to do is have it on the evening of the 18th of December. Which is actually scheduled for a Brisbane talk and so we might just cancel that for that month yep. and instead just have a get together. Right. And we thought if everyone can bring a plate of um, vegetarian or vegan food to share. Yep. And we, following on from Havana's great uh, lead yesterday, maybe in the evening we could have um, some performances from people. So if you'd like to do that, you can see AJ. So if you're a person who can play the guitar or sing or whatever else, we'll have a little session. We'll have some little sessions where that can happen. And then we were thinking too, if you've got some favourite dance music, if you can send the MP3s to us, <coughs> what we'll do is we'll compile them all onto a PC and that's what we'll play for the evening. Right. So there's no restriction, just any song that you like to dance to. Yeah. So uh, we don't want the whole flavour of the evening being heavy metal, but we're, pre <laughs> <laughs> but we're pretty happy to have a heavy metal here and there as well as any other type of music. So, so and even, uh, and we certainly don't want the whole flavour being country, but those of, you <laughs> <laughs> those of you who want a bit of country, we'll go with that as well. So what we'll do is we'll try to uh, sort of have a, lot, a, a really good variety that will suit a lot of different age, age groups as well in terms of dancing. And, uh, and also those of you who are interested in just, if you're happy to play the guitar and sing a little bit or whatever, um, 
the key is that we're not going to be having one person take over the evening, all right? We want everyone to have their fun, uh, so that's uh, something to bear in mind. So that will be the 18th of December, and we were thinking of starting off the evening around 5-ish or 5.30 or 6 o'clock, something around that, and, uh, and then we'll go to the point of where we want to go to, I suppose, which whatever the laws will say, we need to stop, which I suppose is about 10 o'clock at night. Uh, we may need to stop then. And um, the, next, the following day we have a talk here anyway, so... Yeah, so we have to have things tidy anyway for the talk, but it'll be the following day. <laughs> Now, yeah, if, if you're all in recovery on the following day, well, I might change my talk, if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> About self-love. <laughs> but maybe we can send out an email or put something on the website or yeah, something Yeah, like so that. we'll probably drop something on the website, I think, as to the details, and we'll talk with Anna and Peter about what their desires are as well and make sure it's clear about those desires and about what's on the... and we'll place that on the net sometime over the next month. Anyway, so that's, that's the plan. So anyone's invited, including if you're not on the Divine Love Path, you're invited. But be aware that you might get triggered emotionally, if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> that sound all right? Can you say a big, big thank you, Dana, because it's just such a pleasure to be here. Yeah. <laughs> You might like to just stand up so that everyone knows who they're clapping. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying the venue. And, uh, and it's just such a comfortable place, isn't it, for us to come and meet. And, uh, and I was uh, speaking to Peter earlier, in the toilet actually. But <laughs> that's where we meet, you know. <laughs> but... Uh, what we were talking about was um, just uh, once myself and Mary worked through some more things personally where at the moment myself and Mary are working through things personally we, we're trying to do grab ourselves slices of time where we've got private time. Uh, usually it's about a week to a week and a half of time and then we come back into the world I suppose you could say again and then we go back to our little retreat and, um, and deal with our emotions that get triggered. And, and as, that, as we're working through different things, obviously uh, we make changes and as those changes occur, then we may finish up changing how we do presentations and things like that in the future as well. And uh, there are also many people at the moment that are starting to get attracted to the divine truth who do things like um, uh, pantomimes for children and all sorts of type, different kinds of things uh, that we may finish up in the future incorporating into the presentations and, um, and, and because in the venue there's a, the option of using uh, uh, the upstairs room, which is about a 100-seat auditorium as well upstairs, um, we've got some flexibility of what we can do too. So as our own progression goes along, we might start organising some of those things for the, if we have the use of the venue for that, for that time. And so... And, uh, and we're not sure, of course, what's going to happen with the venue itself at this point. So we'll see, we'll see how that pans out. Okay. Yeah, um, can we have a mic over there? Oh, oh I've got the mics. Um, <laughs> so if you have that one, Dave. If you have that one. You, you have that one. Thank you. I'll keep it. No um, yeah, it's my friend um, Ben, and he was here the last time who's taking the pantomime to the children. He's just gone on the road this week yeah. with uh, Sleeping Beauty and he does this whole closed-eye process where he gets all the children to stand up with him and feel what they feel like when, you know, someone says something nasty to you and all this stuff and, and he says, feel your feelings fully, fully feel your feelings. And, and so it's it goes It's all left on. words. Yeah, it's all <laughs> left words. And then he goes... <laughs> You'll remember that. You know. So yeah. they have a lot of fun and it's um, a lot of lighting and music and sound and just fantastic. Yeah, we had an accidental meeting with Ben actually down at the uh, Malula Bar for sure <laughs> and we talked to him quite a lot about what his plans are as well. Um, there was also something I never forgot to mention yesterday. Is Carol here today? Yeah, there she is. Um, can you stand up, Carol? So, so. Um, Carol has got a, a, her place called Heaven in the Hills. 
Um, it's a place, uh, it's on about, what is it, 25 acres or so, up a bit further on the Mullaney in the hills. A really pretty place. She has uh, one, two, three, four, about six, six sort of cabins, isn't there, yes. pretty much? Yeah. One of those is a cottage that can sleep 11 people and the others are a bit smaller. Um, and Carol has decided to open up her Heaven in the Hills in February just for people who are on the Divine Love Path who want to deal with their emotions. All right. So the whole space is there dedicated to just people wanting yeah. to process their emotions? And it's all by donation. So, so it's not like her normal rates that she would normally charge, which I think are around 150 to 200 a night or something like that. So, so it's quite a large donation that you're being given uh, in terms of Carol's space and, and location. It's a lovely location. Um, and myself and Mary have stayed there a number of times at Carol. And it's all powered solar power and beautiful rainwater uh, yeah. in the taps. Yeah. So um, if that's also available to you if you'd like to do that in February. And Carol would like to know how many people would be interested in that. She's sort of not really organising anything for the whole month. What she's doing is relying on everyone else who's coming to organise what they need for that month. That's basically right. And isn't there's it? lots of people coming up to me, like Sharon wants to do some workshops in the kitchen on vegan and raw foods. On well, raw food cooking and things like that. There'll be lots of healing people there. There'll be a punching bag in the shed and some crockery to throw. And um, so that I'm just I'm going to be post operative at that point. So I'm just going <laughs> to let it happen. Let it all happen. Uh, but I'm going to put it in the sanctuary news. Yeah. Um, the times that you can ring and book because I'll be away from my property for a month over Christmas and um, I'd like you to book before or after that yep. and um, I'll, it'll all, all the information will be in the sanctuary news yep. I hope. <laughs> yep. So uh, that's a lovely opportunity uh, available for many of you who are living down the city and afraid to yell and scream a little maybe or afraid to deal with some of the fears or afraid to deal with some of your grieving, grieving emotions in a loud and uh, boisterous manner. And so it just gives you the opportunity to go to a place that is going to be set up for you to be open enough to do those things. So my suggestion is have a, have a contact with Carol through the month of, or the month of February. It's fairly warm up there in February, isn't it? So pretty much, and the evenings yeah, are nice and cool. Yeah, but it's cool. It's generally. five degrees cooler than Brisbane or the coast. Yeah. It's always nice and cool in the yeah. evenings. And yeah. people in the last few years have been lighting the fire at Christmas time, so yeah. It, yeah. it's cooler. Yeah. yeah. And, and it'll be, it'll, it's probably going to be best utilised if people are prepared to share cabins yeah. and there's other spaces you can go to to do emotional work. So yeah, yeah. if you just want to share and um, put your name down and I'll just, just tell me if you want your whole cabin then you, you have to put a good donation in. <laughs> <laughs> Now if you Carol? want to share, if you want to share, I'm easy. I'm not controlling it. No, it's nothing to do with me. Ah. <laughs> Carol's still working on the control issues, aren't you, mate? <laughs> but yeah, so, and also, um, Justin, would you like to just stand up for a moment? Um, there's Justin, uh, Justin Crick. Justin's been on the Divine Love Path now for probably 18 months or so, haven't you, since we, since we met? And uh, Justin has been really being able to get into his own emotions quite well. Remember I said to you, there will be different people who uh, will offer their assistance in the future that I'll let you know about. And I've let you know about Millie, remember? For, and many of you have now visited Millie and, and been helped by Millie. I've let you know about Tristan because he's in that space where he's open emotionally and can help a lot of people emotionally. He's very direct. And now Justin's really getting into that space too and also has a deep desire to help people with their emotions and their emotional processing work. So Justin's uh, started to have exercise his desire to do that. And so I just wanted to introduce you to Justin. Justin, do you want to put your contact What's details your contact or something details, up? Justin? Or? Right. Uh, What's your email? J-C-R-I-C-K. So if you contact uh, Justin that way. Um, 
And so that, that's another opportunity available for you if you want to, and for, particularly for some of you ladies who want to trigger some of your man issues, you might find that might be an issue. <laughs> Justin's had a fair, fair bit of experience in that area <laughs> very recently in his personal life. Um, you, you can also ask Jody about how easily I can trigger. <laughs> <laughs> Jody's uh, Justin's wife, so, <laughs> um, so uh, that's available to you if you want to do it. And as different ones of you get into that space where I know that you're fully choosing emotionally and fully choosing uh, to deal with things emotionally and understand the divine love path well, then I'll be introducing you to the group so that you've got more resources available to help you progress as well. I think that's pretty much covered everything we wanted to cover, isn't it? Thanks, darling. Have a great day, everyone. Yeah. Well, today is about fear, emotions, and false beliefs. That's our discussion today. And I wanted to do t what, today. What I want to do is it about the subject, Dave? Uh, yes, today. You want to ask a question about yesterday? Yes. Okay. Uh, just in regard to uh, spirit attraction. Yeah and one or two other associated. Um, for those that don't know me, I, my name's Dave. Um, I haven't read the forum uh, or anything like that the last week or so, um, and I have no wish to bring the forum into this venue. Um, on Friday, I, I spent the week at the sanctuary, and on Friday um, I was walking in front of a, a bulldozer uh, trying to indicate a path for the bulldozer to clear. Uh, it was quite, um, quite emotional, uh, particularly uh, by, the, by the time we'd finished. I hadn't realised how much emotion I'd been feeling or taking on. I, still I haven't gotten rid of all of that emotion yet. But um, the, the thing I want to get to is that the last couple of days after that, I was experiencing a lot of a lot of emotion and a lot of confusion and I was trying my darndest to get into the emotion and um, it wasn't until this morning when I was um, sitting with Di just, just talking about it and she was trying to help me get into the emotion when I realised or I asked myself the question is there a spirit attraction happening here and when I thought a bit more about it yes there was or, or, an, or an attachment and the moment it came clear to me that there was a spirit attachment, that spirit left. And the heaviness and the confusion that I'd been feeling, um, it left me too. Yep. The confusion that I was having was, yeah, do I really want to be part of this? It's all too hard. Am I doing the right thing? All those sort of things. Yep. So I don't know that the, the spirit's intent were malevolent or anything like that. Uh, I didn't, didn't follow that far. But uh, the moment the spirit left, it, um, I became much clearer in my thoughts and I felt, felt much brighter. Yeah. But the emotion still hasn't been dealt with that attracted the spirit. That's correct, yeah. yes. And the, the, beauty, the beauty of the spirit attraction is that if it heightens your sense of confusion. It heightens your sense of the emotion that you're actually experiencing. And that's not necessarily a bad thing if you deal with the emotion. So a lot of us, what we do when it comes to spirit attraction is we want relief from the spirit attraction. And I understand why, because many times the spirit attraction is even causing physical problems in our body, causing pains in our body and everything. But in the end, um, sometimes we're best sitting with the spirit attraction and just feeling the emotion to its full degree. This happened a few weeks with me ago with me where I was conscious that there were two men spirits with me who had been harmed by women in their life and they were with me, always trying to protect me from, from women who want to harm me. And, um, and what I did was, instead of asking them to leave, I just sat with their emotion and uh, uh, allowed them to project at me all of their intense emotions about women. And within about five seconds flat, <laughs> I got into, and I started writing, and I got into all these really deep core emotions which I could feel my attraction to inside of myself. Does that make sense? Now once I did all of that, then I was starting to process some of the emotions. So it actually helped me get into the real depth of the emotion 
And then once I pro started processing the emotion, then there was less of an attraction. And then what happened is I eventually just talked to them about, well, you know, this isn't conducive now to me getting through all of my own emotion about, now we've got to separate and you deal with your emotion and I deal with mine. And once, uh, but, but what I'm saying is that once I allowed them, those spirits to be there, it actually helped me access my own emotion much more strongly. And my suggestion is the emotion of doubt, confusion, should I be on this path and all of those kind of emotions still now exist within you, but you feel temporarily relieved from them, so that feels quite good. But those emotions are still within you and still need to be accessed. The alternative way of handling it would have been allow those emotions to be present in you and start really connecting to them. How heavy you feel, how much doubt you feel about being on the path, on this divine love path, how much doubt you feel about deal dealing with your emotions and you know, how you know, all of those emotions which are still there inside of you, still percolating. If you allowed, them, allowed this spirit to really connect with those emotions and then write, write or whatever and just allow yourself to start purging those emotions, you probably find connecting to those emotions a lot easier than you will now find it. Because that spirit has now left you and now it's going to be a little bit more difficult for you to connect to some of those emotions. Do you follow me? Yeah, so the, the, the trigger's not, a, not there as intensely as it was. Yeah, that's right. And see, a lot of times what we're doing, and this is something I wanted to discuss with you today, a lot of times what we're doing is we're manipulating our life or controlling our life in such a way that we finish up trying to avoid a lot of our emotional experience. Do you follow what I mean by that? So, so, so in other words, why do I have a toilet that flushes? Well, because I want to avoid the emotional experience of smelling my own poo, basically, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Like, like, like we, don't want to, we don't want to feel that. We want to avoid that emotional experience. That's, I'm being blunt, but that's how it is. Now, so, so um, when, we, when we do things in our life in a bigger way, we're often creating our life around our fears, and we're not aware of it. Right? And so what we finish up doing is creating a comfortable life or a comfortable existence around our fears and we say, oh, I don't have any fears. And of course I don't have any fears because I've just created my entire life and my entire existence so that I don't have any of them triggered. Right? I don't have any of them easily accessible because I've now made my life in such a way that it's worked around all of these different fears that I had. Now the problem we're all going to face in the future is this with regard to fear. What we're going to face is that much of our comfortable life may disappear. Right? Then you'll really know what you're afraid of. Right? And often you'll be afraid of things that you never thought possible, including the smell of your own poo. Right? <laughs> you'll be afraid of that. Right? And so um, a lot of times you'll work your way through different things. Do you, you know, many of us don't think about things like this, but let's say earth changes do occur. And if earth changes do occur, how hard is it going to be to have a paper pulp mill? It's going to be pretty difficult, isn't it? Like, and, and not very harmonious. Most of them are not very harmonious with divine love anyway, are they? Basically, because they're, they're using huge amounts of chemicals to, to process paper. Which means the paper we use to wipe our backside with might not be available. So what are we going to do then? Tobacco leaves. <laughs> Tobacco leaves. <laughs> you see, a lot of the time what's happening it now is we're doing things to work away. You think there's whole industries on this planet that just work around an emotion, if you think about it. Whole industries. You can think of lots and lots of them. Like, for instance, the alcohol industry. That's a big one that works around a lot of emotions, doesn't it? Well, you think about it. Every time you come home from a hard day's work, what do you feel? And you can sit down, Dave, if you want. I have one other thing oh, to add. Sorry. On Go on. Uh, just on that note, and in conjunction with, um, with what happened on Friday, yep. uh, Daniel came up with the, uh, the phrase to me yesterday, and I don't know whether it applies. Uh, he came up with the, the phrase, transition to truth. So it's not, um, it's not loving, as far as I can see, to, to destroy something that's living. 
However, um, somehow I feel we can't go from, from nothing to everything overnight. So in the example of the sanctuary, um, what is loving? For instance, uh, most of us would have come here to hear divine truth in a sense or to, to help us on the divine love path, but we would have come here in motor vehicles. Dave, can I answer some of these questions next fortnight? Because that's when I'm having a question and answer session. Okay. And yep. Because it, it brings up a lot of issues about what is loving, what isn't loving, how do I practice love in my day-to-day -day life and all those things. And a lot of us feel impelled to compromise uh, divine truth because of the environment we're living in. And so there's a lot of questions that that also ra raises. And I can't really answer them all today when I want to do a talk about a different subject, if that's all right. Yep. But, but um, the, when it comes to the fears, a lot of times when you look at what happens in your day-to-day -day life, the law of attraction is actually triggering a lot of your fears and therefore a lot of your underlying emotions. And so when, a, when a, for example, a bulldozer driver comes along and doesn't respect your desire to only clear a certain amount and then finishes up clearing more than that, um, go into your emotion about how you feel about that. Right? Let yourself feel the emotion because that's the law of attraction working. You somehow attracted this bulldozer driver into your life and somehow this bulldozer driver doesn't have the same view as you and there's, and there's already some emotions about that that you have that caused you to attract this man into your life and he's then done some damage that you didn't want done and that's your law of attraction too. So, you know, allow yourself to work your way through that emotionally. If you, as a general rule with everything, if you allow yourself to connect to the emotion before you act on anything, you will always get to the core. Most of us, though, do the opposite. What most of us finish up doing is we connect to the, the effect, whatever the effect is, and then we put into place a heap of plans to mitigate the effect. Right? And that is not really the divine love path anymore. That's what you would do if you were on the natural love path. You would mitigate the effect by doing these different things. Does that make sense? But if we can deal with more of the specifics about the sanctuary and what's going on there and all those other things in the question session, that would be better. Thank you, AJ. So getting back to the issue of fear, almost everything that happens <clears throat> on this planet is the result of somebody being afraid. Whole industries have been created because of your fear. What do you think the insurance industry is? Yeah. Right? It's one of the biggest industries on the planet and it's because of your fear. What do you think about the pharmaceutical industry? <coughs> That's a humongous industry on this planet, right? And it's because of our fear, our fear of our own emotion. In fact, the pharmaceutical industry, industry is because if we could feel all of our own emotion, we wouldn't have the physical ailments that we need to take the pills for to feel better. So in the end, a lot of these industries that are on this planet will need to disappear. What do you think the lawyer industry is about? Like the legal and accounting industry. What's that about? Well, fear of taxation. Right? Or taxation itself, which is a fear in itself. Like, and also all the legal things about why we create this whole society with all these laws, because we're afraid of our law of attraction. Can you see that? We're afraid of our law of attraction and it causes us to go and create an entire society with a, with a long list of laws that you don't even know so that we can mitigate our law of attraction, so that we can run away from what we're actually created at the soul level. Can you see that? Can you see the relationship? So, so what's going on is we've got all of these big, big industries and now there's not only big industries, but there's now whole educational systems about developing these industries and keeping these industries in perpetual motion. Right? So we've got all of these educational systems to, be, to create all of these doctors that give you the pharmaceuticals. And we've got all of these educational systems to create the, the chemists that give you the pharmaceuticals. And there's all this educational system to create the lawyers so that they can actually fight the people who had a negative reaction to the pharmaceuticals. And <laughs> do you know what I mean? And, and we've got all of these industries that are all being created because of one real reason. And that is because we're afraid. That's, that's it. Rekha? Um, thank you. Um, I was wondering 
I teach little children, mm -hmm. and sometimes I feel so help, helpless because they're the perfect trigger for two, for the parents, yeah. and we collecting all of them, and parents happy leave the big issue dumping, and we look after, and it, sometimes I feel I'm doing the right thing, but sometimes am I am I doing the wrong thing? This is what we the question we're asking, isn't it? Yeah. So the question you're asking is like, there the parents come along who've got their law of attraction with their own children, and instead of actually taking responsibility for their own law of attraction and looking after their own children and educating their own children, what they do instead is they for eight hours of the day, give those children to another group of people <laughs> who then have to take responsibility for the law of attraction of the parent and the damage the parent's done to those children. Because, right? because, uh, because they've got to pay the taxation and they've got to, like, we can see how this whole castle gets created, right? And, and when you start looking at the world with, through these different eyes, you can see that actually the majority of the world is in a state of fear and the majority of the world's creations at the moment are due to fears being imposed and reimposed upon us at the soul level. So that's what we need to understand firstly. Now, what else do we need to remember about fear? Well, a lot of times fear is actually just about living in the past. So let's, let's look at that. Uh, so let's, this is a big thing to remember about fear. So fear is living in the past. Now let's look at this at, at a soul condition at an emotional level. So at the emotional level what's going on inside of myself is this. I am afraid of, and let's put something in its place, what are you generally afraid of? So give me something. Rats. You're afraid of rats, okay. Let, let's say rats. Who's afraid of rats by the way, or mice, or any rodents, or any cockroaches, or snakes, or any other creature? Okay, so quite a few. Okay. Spiders, funnel web spiders, whatever. Right. Now, all of this is actually living in the past. Now, let's illustrate it. Something happened when I was little, or something happened to my parents when probably they were little, that caused this emotion to enter them that they became afraid of rats. I had a friend, and I think I've mentioned this before, but I had a friend who's afraid of moths. The reason why she was afraid of moths was when she was very, very young, about three months of age, her older brother, who was about three or four years of age, got one of those great big rain moths. You have seen those, right? They're out when they're wet, where they're out. And that she, he put it un, inside of her clothes in the crib. And she just was all this fluttering going on and this moving thing going on inside of there and she just went berserk and her mum come along of course to find her and she's just crying, crying, crying and in this really state of terror, right, at this point, right, and, and her mum her, her mum didn't realise what was going on and so left the moth there, right, until the mum realised of course that it was actually to do, and until she undressed her, she didn't realise that this moth had actually created all this fuss, right? <laughs> anyway, so that was the event. Now this lady is a police officer now, but she's still afraid of moths. So when she goes up to a door at night to knock on somebody's door to actually look after a sort of like a domestic violence situation or something like that, if the light's on and there's moths around it, <laughs> she can't go in. Just, that's just one thing. Now what's actually happening is she is living in the past. She's living in that three month old event that's not being released. Can you see that? And it's dictating to her the rest of her life. Right? What happens the rest of her life. Now fortunately she can control moths a fair bit. You know, there's such a thing as fly screens, which is a great fear-based invention. <laughs> and there's all these other types of inventions that can help us to actually prevent these creatures from touching my skin, <laughs> right? And so what happens is that all of that can be normally done. And then we have all of these sealed offices where we seal off everything and we seal off all the rooms and then we air condition them and, and get all that happening because it's nice and comfortable of course, which obviously also gets rid of us from feeling hot or cold or 
And cold, by the way, is fear-based usually, and hot, by the way, generally is anger-based. But anyway, we forget all about all that. And what we do is we go instead into this pristine environment so there's no moss around and I can feel comfortable. And so I don't notice this fear is dictating anything to my life anymore until I hit the event, which, of course, the law of attraction will always bring me. Okay? So any fear of any animal basically is bas a thing of living in the past. So how do we deal with that? Well, first we feel our terror about the event in the past. That's what we need to start doing. Now, that means actually allowing ourselves to bodily experience this terror and fear that's within us and experience that emotionally and then go into the underlying emotions. And you know what it will be for this lady? It will be that she felt abandoned by those who loved her through the experience. Right? So there'll be some very, very strong emotions about love involved. And to be frank with you, almost every fear you have is going to end up being an emotion about love in some way being involved that you're afraid to experience. So the same goes with a snake or a spider or a rat or a mouse or a cockroach or a, any of these physical creatures. You see, when you're in a pristine, loving state, all of these animals will just work in harmony with you. So you can walk through an infested mosquito-infested swamp and you won't have one of them touch you huh? when you're in this state. That's the state of celestial spirits in, right? They don't have that happen. Even if they came to earth and materialised, they don't have all these mosquitoes sucking their blood, right? Because they're in this state of love that everything around them is automatically acting in harmony with them and them in harmony with everything around them. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, so it's our fear that causes us to live in the past. And the way that it causes us to do it is that it connects us with the emo unhealed emotion within us that we're not willing to release. And that unhealed emotion basically drives our fears. And so we're really living as a three-year-old in that situation, or a five-year-old, or a seven-year-old, or a ten-year-old. Whatever it was that created the event we're afraid of feeling about, that becomes the frozen emotion that generates everything. Can you see that? I, ju I just had a flash. Did we create the mosquito out of fear? No, we didn't create the mosquito, but we created what the mosquito does out of fear. It yes. wants to bite us. Yes. Yeah. So did we, going back to the fall in the beginning when all this fear-based emotional stuff we yes. created, yeah. did, did elements from the lower spheres like animals and creatures come into the earth plane as a law of attraction? To no, all of the animals and birds and other creatures and mosquitoes and insects and everything in the, every living matter was all available before man came on the scene in terms of org as an organism. But what happened is once man came on the scene, it, remember the soul entered man, once the soul enters man, we become a conscious living man, human. And once that occurred, we had choices. One choice was to live in harmony with all of God's laws and principles, which was one way we had the choice to go. The other way was we had the choice to go down this track of living in harmony with our own desires and principles, which often are very, very different to God's, right? So what the human race eventually did was go down that track, which what is what we refer to as the fall of mankind, right? Now, in the process of the fall of mankind, every living creature that was on this planet began to respond to the, den the degenerate condition of the soul of the human. And that's now been happening for thousands, hundreds, almost over 100,000 years. So, so for, for many thousands of years now, the organisms that surround us have all been happening and all been acting upon the soul condition of man. Now, you can see this change in you. You, you, you watch. When you deal with the emotions that to, to do with getting bitten by mosquitoes, you will find that you never get bitten by a mosquito again in any situation. And only when that emotion comes up unhealed within you and you'll notice that you'll get bitten again right at that instant. Right? 
You see, the, the way God's created the entire world and everything, every living creature on it, and every bird, every animal, and also every living creature in terms of the plants as well, is it responds to our soul condition. This is also why people have done experiments with this, right? You, see, you can see these experiments like if you talk to your plants, your veggie garden, and you demonstrate love to your veggie garden, you'll find you'll get bigger veggies. Why is that? Now, that's a documented fact. But why does that occur? Because there's a different soul thing going on inside of you towards the plant and that creates changes in this plant. And see, this is what we're, we're often right now, even when it comes to things like um, planning for the sanctuary, and this is why I wanted to answer a lot of these questions next, in the next fortnight about the sanctuary. A lot of times the decisions you're making are based upon your own current soul condition and what you feel you need to accomplish in that condition. But if your condition changed, a lot of the things you think you need to accomplish now won't need to be accomplished because they'll automatically happen around you because your soul condition will gather a whole different set of <coughs> circumstances and situations. And so what, we finish up ha ha what fi has finished up happening here on the planet is we are now, right now, judging everything in our complete state of error. So the whole reason why we made mosquito netting was because we wanted to get away from the emotion that we felt when we got attacked by mosquitoes, right? And so we create the netting and now we're in comfort. But those mosquitoes are only attacking me because of the emotion that's within me. And that emotion is not getting dealt with and it's getting handed down generationally from one generation to the next generation, the next generation and so forth. And so what finishes up happening is whole generations need to have mosquito netting now. Right? Because we don't want to deal with the emotion that's within us. And this is what we need to remember is that almost everything that we are choosing to do on this planet now is actually based around the fears that we do not want to feel about the underlying emotions that we need to release and experience and release. So can you see the relationship between fear, emotion and your creation? There is a huge relationship between those things. So fear causes us to live in the past and it's not only our past it causes us to live in. Because many of the issues emotionally within us that we're afraid of healing within us are actually multi-generational. They are multi-generational errors that come from our parents, their grandparents, and even right back hundreds of or even thousands of years. They come from the race that we're a part of. They come from the culture we're a part of and all of these different things. They've all been created to circumvent fear about dealing with the underlying emotion. And so what we end up, happen what we end up doing is we end up judging our current circumstances and situation as truth when they have nothing to do with truth whatsoever. So you have people saying things like, oh, but you're saying I should let myself get bitten by a mosquito. Well, the truth is you need to feel your emotion about getting bitten by a mosquito. And when you release that emotion, mosquitoes won't bite you anymore. That's the truth. But we don't want to accept that truth. That truth sounds way out there, doesn't it? So what we do instead, and you find that lots of criticism that's aimed at me, they say you know, that I have got a utopian viewpoint of the world or whatever. No, I've just got God's viewpoint of the world. You see, God created everything harmoniously. So do you think God created a mosquito just to bite you? Of course not. Right? Mosquitoes have some wonderful things that are a part of the ecosystem that we need to honour. Right? They're a large part of the food chain, for example, in terms of birds and animals. And, and, and so are many of the other creatures that bite you. What we've got to do is look at why they bite us. Why are we so out of harmony with the rest of this creation that an animal would choose to bite me? An animal, by the way, that God created. There must be a reason, right? There must be a reason inside of me that would cause that. And I need to look at that emotionally, look at that reason. You see, we're living in the past, not only of our own past, but in the past of the unhealed many that have come before us as well. And it's up to a generation on this planet to stop this cycle. 
And we can be the generation that stops this cycle. And it's quite easy to stop the cycle. That's the irony. It's so easy. It's just, I, well, I should say simple probably. But, <laughs> but, but really quite easy. You think, of, you think of all the things we've created to perpetuate the cycle. Some of these creations are difficult creations. You know, there's high technology involved in many of these creations that we've generated in this world we live in just to perpetuate the cycle of fear. Right? If we had all of that technology aimed in a total different direction, amazing, that, it would be amazing what that would be like, wouldn't it? All that technology aimed in a totally different direction. So at the moment we've got like the world's biggest industry is arms manufacture, right, pretty much. Now, there's like, and the biggest arms manufacturers are the five permanent Security Council members on the UN. So you know how they talk about arms dealers and how bad they are and terrible soil condition? Well, the five biggest arms dealers are the leaders of the five Security Council nation members. So who, what do you think about their soul condition is going to be compared to the others who are just the, the mum and dad arms dealers, if we can call them that? What, what, what is it in comparison? Now, let's just say, why do we manufacture a bullet? Because we're afraid of death. Now, isn't this another irony about fear? What we fear, we finish up creating in another did you get that? I'm manufacturing a bullet to kill another person to stop that person from killing me. Isn't that why I manufacture a bullet? Right? And if that's the case, what am I actually doing? I'm killing the other person first. I'm actually creating what I'm afraid of. Right? And you'll find this is a general pattern in all of your life. Whatever you're afraid of, you will actually finish up creating through your actions. So, ladies, if you're afraid of men, you're going to finish up creating more men who project at you sexually or, project or, or damage you sexually in that process. By, you know why? Because a little, child, a little child man, a little boy, is going to grow up feeling terrible about himself and his own sexuality if he's in your company. And when he becomes an adult, what do you think he's going to do with that? He's going to become what you have created. The same applies to the men, by the way. If we grew up, uh, if we have an adult man and a child girl, and, I, and here I am, I've got lots of, like in my case, needy emotions towards women. What am I going to create in this child? I'm going to create a woman who thinks she's got to please her daddy all the time, or a woman who thinks that she can get away with murder with a man all the time. Right? I'm creating what I'm afraid of in each case. We have a mic here. Thank you. What about women and the menopause, for example? Mm -hmm. Is that being afraid of getting old? And what are the hot flashes? Is that a feeling of <laughs> um, being well, ashamed? A good, very or? good question. Very good question. They are all fear-based reactions, all of them. And um, let's look at the, the menopause in terms of there's a, there's a fear of sexuality, there's a fear of no longer... Let's look at all sorts of issues here, because uh, they're all fear-based. Many women enter, enter the, uh, what would you call it, productive form of their life at a very young age. Even there, there are some even known to have children at nine years of age now. Now, how does that happen? That happens because there's a general emotion within the whole group of women that you're not a woman until you have a child. Right? You're not a valid person and you're not a feminine person until you've had a child. And you see that all the time, don't you, on this planet, where it's only when you have children that you become valid. Histor historically, this has been the case, men would actually divorce their wives who didn't give them a child. Right? And what do other women think about a woman who's not out of a child? A lot of times there's a projection of like, you wouldn't know you've had, not had a child. You wouldn't know you wouldn't have a child. <laughs> you, know, there's this, there's a, you know, they look at you as if, I only know because I've had a child. When you're a mother, you will understand. 
Understand what? How to damage your child or <laughs> understand love or what? You know? because, because in the end, a lot of times that's what we're doing by projecting these emotions, right? So let's say we grow up with these emotions. We enter fertility at young ages now, right? Really young ages. So by the time most women are 25, most have had maybe one child or two children or three children, and a lot of them, because of the way of this emotion is driving them, they don't get to live their own life. They're living their life because through their children and for their children. So how does that feel when you're living your life for someone else, even if it's for your child? It feels like you've given up a lot, doesn't it? Doesn't it? There's another emotion there. I've given up everything for my family. Now, don't you think, ladies, that you get tired of that feeling, that you're giving up everything for your family? Of course you do. Many of you are feeling that emotion, right? And so what happens eventually is your body starts closing down its reproductive system because you're now angry and upset about how much you've had to live through it in the past. And not only that, how much men have damaged you through it in the past and how much of these anger and resentment emotions you feel about it from the past. And a lot of these things are true. They, you have been damaged from it in the past and men have treated you badly in the past about a lot of these things. And so what happens then is your body hits this point where you start shutting down. And then on top of that, there's all these hot flush things. What's that all about? Well, that's all about this sexual shame, this shame that you feel about your own sexual organs and your own reproductive system and the shame you feel about your life and how, how your life has been changed and conformed. You can't just go out there and have free sex right, without there being a consequence of one, or maybe a child coming along or maybe a disease coming along and all these different things. And, and so there's all of these things going on emotionally inside of you. What will happen is, when you release all of those emotions, you will be able to conceive a child whenever you want. You won't need birth control. You won't need any other, you know, rhythm method or any other type of method to control anything because your body will do exactly what you desire it because you've now released all of these other fears and, 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 and addictive emotions that cause it to do something different. And that's how God created you to be. But you have to be at one with God to be able to do that. Well, no, it's not so much being at one to be able to do that. What it is, the process of becoming at one with God does two things for you, remember. Firstly, it creates the relationship with God where you then absorb all of God's truth. But the second thing it does is it creates a relationship with yourself in a pure form. In other words, you love yourself the same way that God loves you in the end. Did you follow me? Yeah. Now, the subsequent result of that condition is that you will have all this control over all these other things, including complete control over what happens to your body. Does that make sense? Yes. At any you. time. So, so you can be 150 years of age, and by the way, in the future there'll be many of you who may even live to 150 years of age, or even 200 years of age, or to be frank, even 700, 800 years of age, right? Because the body is totally capable of doing this. Scientifically, it's a proven fact that your body is capable of doing this. They still don't know what the death gene's all about, right? Why does our body degrade after 25 years? They don't know. Every seven years before then, it replicates itself perfectly, represents itself perfectly, grows into a new place. All of our lines don't appear and still we start getting above 25, 26, 27. And then what happens is that our body starts <coughs> degrading in its replication process. And it's a known fact. And, bodies, and there's whole bodies of scientists looking specifically at what the genetic reason for that is. The genetic reason for that is. Well, the truth is, well, all genetic reasons are created by the soul condition. What we need to do is look at the soul condition, why that happens. Can you see what I'm saying? And when we look at the soul condition of why it happens, it will stop happening. And when we, Because our genes, our body just responds to the soul condition. You, you can see this, you'll see this in your progression, guaranteed. You'll get into a denial of emotion. Last week, I got into a denial of emotion, of a love of self-emotion, right? My thumb in one day had a huge crack down it that started bleeding. Just, no, I did nothing to it. I didn't break it, the skin, I didn't cut it, I didn't do anything. It just cracked open and started bleeding by itself. Just a denial of emotion. The opposite is also true. As soon as I start accepting that emotion, my thumb starts repairing itself again. Well, why does that happen? 
because I'm dealing with a soul condition issue and it's just telling me what the issue is. Do you, does that make sense? And so you deal with the issue and it heals up and it's not yet healed completely because I'm still dealing with it. But I've seen things heal inside my own body in one single day. I had a great big cataract on my eye. I had it on my eye for one month. It was on my left eye. And people were saying, oh, you should go to the doctor. When I blink, you know, when you blink with a cataract, it just interferes with blinking. It's so annoying and it's frustrating. And after a while, it's quite painful, right? Your body doesn't moisturise the eye properly once you've got a cataract because your eyelid's not firmly over it and everything. And it, just, and, and it was just growing right in the centre of my left eye. Once I deal, dealt with some anger towards women, within two days it went. But I had it for a month before then. Why did that happen? Because if you deal with the soul condition emotion, you will actually get rid of what the soul condition is creating. That's what happens. This is what happens with all of these questions. So every question you can ask about why am I not perfect is all about there's something going on in my soul condition that causes me not be, to be perfect the way God created me to be. So many of you will start experiencing the process of regaining your hearing, for example, when you start dealing with the reason why you don't want to hear anybody. Many of you will start regaining your sight, like I will, when I start dealing with the issue of why I don't want to see into the future, <laughs> right, which is my long-distance vision problem. Right? Many of us will start Repair, our bodies will just start repairing automatically and growing younger as we get older as a result of dealing with different emotions. Jen, right. thanks, the back there. Um, two things. I agree wholeheartedly about the how hot flushes because I've been noticing I get more hot flushes when I'm in an emotional state mm -hmm. and I can relate to everything that you just said about being feminine. It goes way back. But I would like to talk about fear. I watched um, the exorcism of Emily Rose yep. this morning. Yep. I went to the video shop yesterday and got it. I couldn't watch it last night. I was in the house on my own and I thought that I'm going to be... That would have been the best I know, time for you. I know. <laughs> but anyway. I know. Um, and I actually... <laughs> I went to bed in fear oh, of just it. thinking about watching it. Yeah, yeah. And then about three o'clock this morning, I woke up and thought, um, God, I really don't want to look at this fear now. And all of a sudden, it just disappeared. Yeah. But I watched it this morning, and I am very confused about my emotions that came up with that movie. I had some fear. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as strong as what I thought it was going to be. The emotions that were the strongest, yeah. I felt a lot of empathy, a lot of sadness and sorrow and hurt for Emily Rose. Yeah. And I felt quite sick in the stomach and I did a lot of crying. Yeah. So I'm a bit confused about why. This is the beauty of... You, can you see firstly that you were afraid to watch the movie? Because you, you were actually thinking that it would turn out to be a different experience than it really was. Can you see that? Yeah, I was, I was scared of what I was thinking I was going to go through. Exactly. See, this is a problem with fear. Most of the time we don't finish up going through what we think we're going to have to go through. And the problem with fear is it just prevents us from going through anything because we just lock ourselves up completely and we don't deal with it. Imagine if you had responded to that fear and decided, no, I'm not going to watch the Emily Rose movie what would then happen is you wouldn't have got to some of these other emotions. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so a lot of times we get, we get hear something from someone else and that triggers our fear in a different way and then we go into this fear place and our fear becomes unreasonable. It's totally unreasoning. There's no logic to our fear at all, to be frank, because our fear is about false expectations appearing real. So all night you had all these false expectations about what, what would happen when you watch the movie. When you watch the movie, look what happened. There was a whole different set of things that happened. You were grieving about the fact she didn't know the truth. Wouldn't it be wonderful if she knew the truth? And you've connected with a lot of those emotions, right? Yeah. About how wonderful it would have been for her to know the truth compared to living that and eventually dying in that state, not even knowing the truth. But, you know, the mind's a funny thing. The mind's now going, gee, 
I watched the movie, but I was so afraid of watching the movie. There must be something else going on here. I, I, must, I should be afraid of watching the movie, <laughs> right? Yeah. Can you see the reason for your confusion? Yeah. Because basically what was happening is your fear set up a false state of belief inside of your mind, which you then thought you had to carry out in some way, and after it didn't happen, you're sitting there in confusion because it didn't happen the way you expected. Yeah. And that's the trouble with false expectations appearing real. They're all creators of fear, and they all seem to be something that we expect, but in the end it doesn't happen often. And that's what we need to come to terms with. So your sense of confusion is about you wanting, you're sort of almost disappointed that what you thought should have happened didn't happen. Yeah, really. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the reason why that is is because your mind set up this constraint based on some other fears that you have, set up this constraint of I'm going to watch this movie, I'm going to get badly triggered, I'm just going to go into terrible terror about you know, spirits and whatever else, and none of that happened. That's right. So this is the problem with fear. A lot of times nothing that we fear will happen, happens. Mm. So why, why did I feel the grief and the sorrow? Well, that's grief that you feel about people in the world not having truth and the amount of pain that it causes them. Yeah, well, except that's exactly what I've been going through for the last three or four days. Exactly. Yeah, can... I didn't think about it being um, connected with truth. Exactly. Um, because what, I, what it brought up for me, a memory that I could remember, I was in a production of Jesus Christ Superstar. Yep. And I used to get so emotional when we did the crucifixion. Yeah. scene yeah. I would just get so and that's how it felt yeah sickening you know and I thought well maybe I've got a spirit attachment like a spirit who went through that at the time that was attached to me and then I thought well maybe I had a spirit attachment to someone who went through the same sort of thing as Emily Rose just give up all this thinking okay because it does you no good right what you need to do is connect to the feeling yeah. What's the feeling when you when you watch G, when you get into the production of Jesus Christ Superstar and you watch my crucifixion? What actually do you feel? What I are you feeling? I felt sorrow and hurt and pain. So about a loss of love on the earth, isn't it? Yeah. It okay. Would, yeah. So so go into that emotion. That's about your own life and the loss yeah. of love in your own life. Yeah. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And and about Just being unjustly um, unjustly punished. Killed. Yeah, 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 for doing something good. Mm. There's another emotion in your yeah. own life. Okay. Right? So let yourself feel that emotion. You don't need to intellectualise, oh, what's it about? Is there a spirit attached mm. to me? Is there not a spirit attached? None of that. You don't need to do that because in the end, the emotion is there, present. Feel it. When you feel it, it will release from you and you'll know what it was all about. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, thank and, you. And this is why it's so important to... to to understand the fear and then get underneath that fear into the actual emotion that is creating these things. Yep. So many times with fear, and this is, I wanted to give you some reminders about fear today so that you can understand what's really going on in your life with regard to fear. And why fear is such a debilitating emotion when in reality, and most of the time, everything that we fear often never happens. And if it does happen, it's because we're afraid of it so much, generally, because through the law of attraction. So oftentimes, you know, 99% of the times, actually, what we're afraid of doesn't happen. But many of you ladies, when you had your children growing up, were afraid of your child going out on the road, right? Would you say that pretty much all of you were afraid of that at some point? Okay. Okay, how many of you actually had a child get run over? Can you put your hand up if you had a child got run over? All right, one. Two? You got... I had a child with two brothers. Two brothers, but let's we'll look at a child in this case, right? My ch a child or... Yeah. One, one person. The rest of you, how many other women... Ha if you put up your hand if you have had children and you were at some point afraid about them getting run over at some point. Right, so... How many people do you think that would be? It looks about probably 40 or 50. So one out of 50 actually had it happen. Can you see how the rest of the, 50, the 49 of you were just afraid of it happening? Can you see that? 
slowly. And the mic down here. Um, I was actually run over, and so I think I carry that fear. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, and of course you would if you were run over. Yeah. You would definitely carry that fear. And if your mother had a child run over, you, you would probably carry that fear too. Do you know what I mean? I'm not criticising the fear of the actual event in this case. What I'm saying is the majority of us finish up having fears that never even happen to us. Right? All of our life they never happen to us. And we say, oh yeah, it never happened to us because I was afraid. And I was rightly afraid and you know, I kept my child inside and all those kind of things and that's why it never happened to us. And to be frank, you might be right. But all you were doing then was working around your fear where you're not in that situation. Alex, and then... So AJ, what was the difference between the lady and the other 49 people who it didn't happen to? There must be some emotion inside of the family, not just inside of yourself, but inside of the family that would have created a law of attraction event that a child would pass in such a manner. Does that make sense? So it's a multi-generational, usually family-based emotion that creates such law of attraction events. Now, um, myself and Claire, Peter's uh, wife, have talked about this because Peter and Claire had their child, two, uh, two years of age, I think she was at the time, wasn't she? She died at two years of age, their only daughter. And Claire talked to me about what she could see after processing through a lot of this emotionally, what she could see as the law of attraction, what was actually happening. And it actually was related to something that happened in Claire's life when Claire was two years of age where Claire nearly drowned and she had a huge terrors and fears about a drowning in this case and her actual daughter finished up drowning but not her sons. Right? And there's whole linkages in all of these events to law of attraction events and we can discuss them at another time because it's not the discussion today. The discussion today is about fear. You see what happens is I tell you that story about Peter and Claire's child and then all 40 or 50 of us who have children of that age start to worry about our child drowning. Does that make sense? And this is what happens to the world today because we, we have a pathway open in our soul to accept fear. And this is one mechanism of the soul that I want to talk to you about. How the soul actually accepts false beliefs inside of itself. Right? And this is what happens. And this, this is what goes on inside of you that allows you to accept a false belief and then act upon it for the rest of your life even when you don't need to. So remember, here's our soul. Our soul is our passions, desires, longings, isn't it? Desires longings, intentions, ETC, all these different things, right? So there's our soul. Now remember our bodies, there's our physical body, our spirit body, physical body, they are just attached to our soul, right? You could think of them, remember, as tools that the soul uses to express itself in the dimensional space in which it exists. So the dimensional space you're currently spending most of your time in, you know, two-thirds of your time, is spent in this physical dimensional space. And so you use two-thirds of the time this physical body to express your soul's passions, longings, desires and everything else and that's what's happening for you in this in your awake state. And then when you go to sleep you start expressing your soul in your spirit body form. So what happens in that state is you enter the, one of the spirit dimensions, whatever your soul condition allows you to enter, and you start expressing yourself through that dimension, through that body. And remember this is a half of the soul of course, half of the soul. Now one thing we haven't talked about much is how matter is made up inside of the soul itself. And over coming years I'll spend a fair bit of time talking about these kind of things with people who want to know scientifically what's really going on. But to just give you some examples, the soul has all of these energetic pathways that are very, very similar in construction to your brain. 
So what happens, in your brain you know there's this whole network of, <coughs> there's this whole neuro network and chemical network that goes on. And the neurons have synapses, which, uh, synapses, which allow chemical connections to occur between two different parts of your brain. And the, the brain is organised in such a way that all these pathways get constructed based on your experiences. So as your experience of memory grows, different parts of your brain grow and store those memories, of course. And, and of course they're not actually stored in your brain, to be frank. But these pathways get constructed in your brain in, to enable them to be expressed through your physical body. Because the actual memories are stored in your soul. And then get reflected to the spirit body and then the material body. But if you can just picture your soul for a moment like this energetic pathways of all these different connection points all happening. Now when an error enters your soul, it sets up a pathway for more error to enter your soul. And when truth enters your soul, it sets up a pathway for more truth to enter your soul. This is what happens to your soul, physically. So if you could think of it now, if we just rub out all of that as emotion, because that is all true, of course, but we just rub it out and we just think of it like this brain, if you like, where these all little tiny networks are getting constructed, right? All little tiny networks that get constructed off of each other as, they, as you work your way down through the different emotions that you're experiencing, right? And all these networks finish up connecting up with each other. Can you see? Now remember emotion is energy in motion. Remember that? What happens is when these connection points enter up, there is now an unimpeded movement through this pathway, if you like, of a certain emotion. Does that make sense? Just like there is unimpeded pathways through your brain. It's a very, very similar construction. So what's happening now is there's these unimpeded, un unimpeded motions that can flow through your soul. Now let's look at the effect of error and truth on your soul. So we'll just rub out these bodies for a moment because they really are just the tools the soul uses and are not really part of the conversation. What happens is we have error based, remember all error enters the soul emotionally, right? You understand that? They're all emotions. And all truth enters the soul emotionally as well, actually. So they're all emotions too. Right? Now what they do is they construct their own networks, allowing the pathway of different emotional after that point and different awarenesses and different belief systems. So what happens is we have a whole set of emotions that start entering our soul that construct a pathway that is actually sympathetic to error. In other words, we have a pathway happening through our soul because of all the damage that's happened to our soul emotionally. We have this pathway where emotions only flow when I'm in error. And the emotions of truth will not flow because those pathways are blocked within my soul from flowing. Can you see what's going on there? The emotional... The, the emotions of error create these pathways which then only allow emotions of error to flow through them. Right? So basically what will happen is I have an emotion come to me. So let's say something happens in my life and there's an emotion come to me that creates a pathway within my soul. And if I don't release it from my soul, it remains in my soul as an error. And that creates a pathway for future emotions of error to enter me and therefore future beliefs of error to enter me. Do you follow, follow? Okay. Now, if you can think about it like this. My soul, when I begin my emotional processing work and I begin my pathway towards God, is full of these little connection points everywhere in my soul, all these connection points, where only certain types of emotions can flow through my soul, in and out of my soul. Right. And only the emotions that can flow are the ones that actually are based around m what my emotional sympathies are. And they were created through my entire life's experience. So let's say my emotional sympathy is, I, when I'm a bad person, I deserve punishment. 
Can you see where that emotional sympathy might come from? When we're young, what happened? Mum or daddy's there saying, you're a bad naughty girl. You either go off onto your room or you get a bit of a paddywhack on the backside or for some people it's even more violent than that, right? Out with the ruler or a big stick and you get sent off to your room. So you feel the pain in your backside about feeling something that you felt which you can't feel anymore and that creates another pathway where I'm not allowed to feel that anymore. So that's blocked off. I'm not allowed to do that. My soul goes in a different direction. Just a new connection being made, just like a new connection being made in your brain. This new connection is being made in your soul and now I have this belief that love means that sometimes there's a justification for violence. That's my belief. It's error. But when somebody comes along, like AJ comes along, and he says, you know, there is never a justification for violence. I have this feeling rise in me. No, that's not true. What if I was raped? What if I was... Like, what if my child was being harmed? What if I, and I come up with all these scenarios, right, inside of myself. Where are they coming from? They're coming from these emotions that are causing this pathway to be the only way that I can feel. I can only feel that there is a justification for violence because I don't want to feel that there is none because if I did that, I'd have to actually feel that my parents didn't love me when they were violent towards me. And that emotion is so painful for me to experience. I don't want to experience that. And instead, I've allowed this emotional pathway to remain inside of my soul that only the beliefs that match that pathway will I accept. So somebody comes along and says, you know, God's a punishing God. Yep, I can accept that. In that state, I can accept that. That's why, you know, why do you think there's one and a half billion children of God on this planet who are Christians who believe in a punishing God? Because they have this pathway being developed in their soul through all of their emotional experiences that love and punishment go hand in hand at times. You get punished for the good, for the bad, you get like pleasure for the good. That kind of experience has gone through them. This is why these religions are so acceptable because there's already an emotional pathway through the soul allowing the belief to enter. Can you see that? Right. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before. So, here's this emotional pathway in this soul. I shall use difficult. Here's the emotional pathway in the soul that allows my false belief now to pass into me and get stored into me down in this little area of my soul. And it required all of these other pathways to be true before this new one could enter me. Does that make sense? This new belief can only enter me as a part of my emotional system by there being a whole previous set of events that created all these different connections that finished up leading to the point where this new belief could enter me. Right. And once that new belief enters me, it becomes a fixed part of my soul. That's an error that I think is true. I believe this truth with all of my heart, as the saying goes, and yet it can be totally in error. And the only way it could enter me was because of all the previous events that entered me and entered me through my emotional condition, creating all these connection points that are continuously growing inside of my soul. Now, understanding this is very, very important because we start to see the relationship between belief, fear, and emotions. Now remember the fear is the false expectations appearing real. In other words, it's the error looking like, emotionally looking like, it is truth. So when I make a statement, there is no justification for violence ever, for many of us when we first heard that statement, we felt very much in disagreement with that. And the reason why was because this pathway in our soul had been created that aligned love with justified violence. And we didn't want to feel, we were afraid to feel the emotion that our parents' justified violence towards us was not justified. 
and that it was actually unloving. And we're afraid to feel that emotion because that emotion feels terrible. <coughs> when you actually connect to that emotion and feel it, it feels shocking to know that even these people who should have loved you didn't actually love you because they themselves didn't even understand love at the time that they were belting you or committing violence against you. And then there's also all these other things going on. I'm now a parent and I've actually done exactly the same thing to my own children. Wow, like how much emotion is there in that to feel? You see there's quite a lot to feel in that, isn't there? Can you see that? Now as that's happening, all this error starts to get all jumbled up, doesn't it? So what's happening now is the truth is starting to try to enter me. But you see, the soul itself has this construction where the error is easy to accept, but the truth is hard to accept. And so our soul has a deep resistance to truth as a result of this problem. Right? And it has a deep resistance to the truth because of the emotional pathways that are inside of us, that have entered us through our life, that are based around error is about love. And that's why the truth has such a hard and, and a difficult time entering us. And so when somebody comes along and says, oh, let's talk about the law of cause and effect, which is a truth of God's universe. We start looking at law of cause and effect and saying, what? You mean, you mean I've got to deal with the cause rather than the effect? And yes, the law of cause and effect is basically saying to you, if you want to solve a problem, you're going to have to deal with the cause of the problem rather than the effect. Now that sounds logical, but let's put it into practice in our day-to-day -day life. I get a headache. I get a headache. I know that my trusty aspirin or whatever it is, I can't even remember the names anymore, um, my trusty aspirin will cure my headache within five minutes. And then somebody comes along and says, actually your headache is because of a denial of an emotion. But you have got this tablet here, five minutes, and you're going to be without this headache. <laughs> Dealing with this emotion, like on this other hand, this emotion might, might take me five weeks, and I'm going to have a headache for five weeks. Like, <laughs> Which would you do? Which would you prefer to do? You see, the error is, the error is, I want instant gratification, so what do I do? I generally would go for the tablet. Right? And I say, yeah, no worries about the emotion, but I'll go for the tablet anyway, because that <laughs> relieves me straight away. Right? So what have we done there? We have just dealt with the effect inside of the brain, of the physical body, of what the soul just created without actually dealing with its cause. So am I going to get another headache? Guaranteed. So I'm going to need to go and buy some more aspirin. So it, can you see how the whole pharmaceutical industry came about? Because you need to buy your aspirin to avoid the headache that you could actually deal with the cause of another way, but we don't want to deal with the cause. So anyway, we start learning about this law of cause and effect. And so what do we do? We say, no. I don't want to have to deal with the effect uh, of the cause. It's too long-winded, it's too hard. It's like, and then we start getting angry with God. Why did you make this law of cause and effect? I, I, I like my tablet, you know. I don't want to have to give up. The, I don't want to have to face the cause, right? And so we start arguing with the law and we argue with God and the universe and we argue and you finish up arguing with me half the time about it as well. You know, it doesn't help anything. Your headache's still there. And, and in the end, it doesn't help us get to the problem, which is I have an emotional pathway within my soul that causes me to accept that I should cure an effect rather than dealing with the cause. And I don't want to accept the truth that actually I would be better off dealing with the cause rather than the effect. Can you see that? Now I'm not saying in this discussion to give up your medication. What I'm saying is to understand that I am on the medication because I don't want to deal with an underlying emotion that is creating the need for that medication. And in fact, I am also dealing with the effect of not dealing with that emotion rather than dealing with the cause, which would actually cure the problem completely. 
Now, that, so then I have this truth enters me. So the truth is the law, in this case that I've given, the law of cause and effect. So that's an example, laws of cause and, eff and effect. But my emotional pathway inside of myself says, no, I want to deal with the effect. I don't want to have to deal with the cause. And I have all sorts of anger about dealing with the cause. I have all sorts of fears about dealing with the cause. I don't want to deal with the cause. I want to have the instant effect. So instead of addressing the cause, I address the effect, which means I'm going to have to address the effect the next time, the next time, next time, next time, every time. I'm going to have to deal with the effect. And the effect is going to get so bad that I may even get brain cancer and die from this effect. Right? And eventually the pill won't save me from that. Like, try to take aspirin for that. Right? That's what eventually happens. We go so far down this road of actually not being able to accept the truth. Now, what we want to do is undo that process, you see, don't we? We want to undo the process. We've got these constructions in our soul. Now, every single person has a different construction of what is acceptable and not acceptable as a belief. This is why there is such a plethora of um, you know, myriads of beliefs on this planet, all sorts of beliefs. You can go into one church who are meant to have one belief and you talk to every person in that church and guarantee the majority of them have a different belief. You try it one day. Like, it's a really interesting process. Oh, they believe this part, they believe this part, they believe this part, because there's all these pathways in the soul that have been created that are individual to that particular person. Right? And so what do we do? We start, we start rejecting divine truth in preference for our own truth because it's our own truth that passes everything through unimpeded and we feel good with it. That's what happens inside of ourselves. And we can undo it, but it requires a deconstruction of the construction that has been done over our life. Now let's see how this affects belief systems. All right, somebody comes along to me and says, you know, there's this new belief. This new belief is the belief about reincarnation, right? that you know, you've had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lives or hundreds of lives over long periods of time and what happens is you come to earth, you have this um, experience on earth that's a result. The reason why you have this experience is because it was attracted from the previous experience on earth and whether you're a bad or you're good, this was the early beliefs of the, re of the reincarnation belief. Whether you're bad or good in the previous life, that created this new life for you and you have this new life and it's a result of the karma of the old life and then if you're a good person and you did good in that one, you got a better life the next time you went past. And then of course they added to that after a period of time and you had to go to the spirit world because we now know there's a spirit world and when people die I can talk to them so there must be a spirit world and they haven't instantly come back to earth. So you see originally the original re reincarnation beliefs were that as soon as you passed, you entered another person who was being born. Right? So that, that was given up because w there were a lot of people who were mediums now who could talk to people who have passed that haven't been reborn. So, you know, so they worked out some modifications to the belief. <laughs> and the modification to the belief was that you go to the spirit world for a period of time, you have a life review. Right? And, then, um, and then you come back to earth and you enter this new life. And then, then of course, they started talking to the spirits who weren't coming back to earth who are higher in their development. Oh, okay, so we've got to modify the belief again. And the new belief is that when you get past a certain point, you don't have to come back to Earth. You can actually progress, or you don't need to progress anymore. You've reached the nirvana state and you don't progress after that state. So that's my, now my belief. Now, now, that's a fairly convoluted belief when you think about the whole thing. But why did that belief enter me emotionally? Because when I've stated the truth to you about reincarnation beliefs, many of you have had huge emotions about that, right? Haven't you? Many of you, have, like I know many who have gone away from the divine truth for six months while they've worked their way through this, that one belief. I know many at the moment who are so angry and frustrated with me that they're posting things on the internet about me supposedly being a guru and whatever else, and, and wanting to create a cult just because they don't want to face the reincarnation belief. Now, why is that? 
because there's an emotional pathway inside of their soul that predisposes them towards the reincarnation belief. Jen? Um, where does learning fit into all of this? Are we attracted to learning cert certain things from an emotional denial perspective or can learning be liberating? It's a very good question and the answer is the same as all of this what we'll be going through today. So, so we'll talk more about learning truth as a part of this process too. But it's a that great question. The truth is that our soul is built to learn. This is why it creates these structures. But unfortunately for most of us what we're learning is error. And then the, it, that allows us to learn more error. It allows us to put, build upon a construction of error. And in the first century I likened it to a house built on the sand. And when winds come and rains come, it just disappears. That's what I likened it to then. Mary? Can I ask you also, yep. is it alright? Uh, I will answer this question that you asked throughout the rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs> what about the interpretation of experience? So you experience something that's brand new. Do, does your beliefs, your belief system, your beliefs then colour totally. how you interpret your, your totally. experience? And that's what I want to illustrate with this And that with can this be totally wrong, can't it? Totally. Yep, we will look at that with this reincarnation belief. I'm not sure if it's the right time to share it, but I wanted to talk about um, my experience of belief and emotion uh, yep. and error. Um, I'll just write down reincarnation so I can remember to continue my discussion on the subject. Because there's a lot I need to say about it, how, about how it actually, um, reincarnation, how it actually enters the soul and why it enters the soul. But go ahead. Brad. For me, uh, the beautiful thing about the soul and this process that you've just described is um, when, when I first rediscovered the divine truth, a, a lot of the um, beliefs, I, were, I already obviously had the pathways because um, it just entered me really easily. But in terms of the, um, the things that I rebelled against emotionally, um, I... I've just experienced the beauty of the fact that all I had to do was um, release the emotions. The only reason we're in error is because we shut down our emotions. Mm -hmm. So I, I had some faith that I was going to reach these beliefs, but I didn't experience them emotionally until I deconstructed every synapse. Mm -hmm. And then there was a beautiful feeling of, wow, this belief is is real mm. and so I, I wasn't just taking your word for it anymore mm. I was experiencing it emotionally mm. and um, it was really only the process of shutting down any emotion that allowed more error and more built the synapses if you like yeah, yeah. that's it all right so what I want to do is go back to this reincarnation because we can illustrate it through this belief you see what happens is because the soul has all of these pathways already open I can then accept new experiences as experiences of error. In other words, I can explain a new experience through my old belief system. So let's say I start out, I believe in reincarnation. Now why do I believe in reincarnation? A lot of times it's because I went along to a past life therapist. And what happens is when I sat down in front of a past life therapist, they put me into a sort of a semi-hypnotic type of state. And in this state, unbeknown to myself, spirits can connect to me very easily. But I don't know that. Right? So I just all of a sudden start spouting a lot of stuff that my therapist captures on a video camera for me. So she takes a picture, a video of me going through this experience that I've never known about before. And the experience happens to be I lived in the 16th century and I was this particular person and I had this particular experience and I died this particular way and I start crying and everything and it's very feels very real right and so I come out of that and I look at that video camera and I connect with the emotions even as it's played back to me and so I go wow I must have lived in the 16th century as that particular person so that means that reincarnation must be true right? And then uh, we go along a bit more and then we go along to a spirit medium. 
and we sit down in front of the spirit medium and she says, oh, in a past life you were uh, a 16, in the 16th century. You were this, you know, you did this and that. Oh, there, there's another reinforcement. I'm a reincarnated person from the 16th century. And then you go along to another medium and she says, oh, there's quite a few uh, past lives you've had. You've actually had 796 past lives, actually. And, and, uh, and well, we don't know where she's getting this information from, but because of my emotions about the previous two events, I'm now very open to accepting what this lady's now saying to me, right? And so I accept I've had 796 past lives. And then I start a process of discovery of these past lives. And every process that I go through seems to indicate that I have had these past lives. So, oh, well, you know, calculating it all from an intellectual perspective, most of the lives would have been, you know, anywhere from 20 to 80 years of age, let's say. So that means in the last century, you know, last four centuries in between the 16th century and now, I probably have had, what, let's say, about, what, eight other lives. And look what happens. I go along to another past life therapist and one of those lives comes in and they speak their stuff. I get that picture taken and the, and the, memory, and the memories are all recorded and I go through another experience. And that just emotionally settles inside of me because I've now got this pathway open, emotionally settling inside of me and it settles inside of me. Now I think I had that experience as well. Now I've had two past lives that I can verify emotionally. And I can believe that really strongly now, right? And then it's three, and then it's four, and then it's five, and then it's ten, and then it's twenty. And before I know it, I've got thirty or forty of them that I'm starting to connect to if I'm really diligent in doing this work. Now the problem is that all of that entered me via some emotions. What are the emotions? The thing I need to ask myself is, what do I get out of having these past lives? <coughs> what is the feeling I get from having them? A sense of maybe purpose, a sense that I have lived a long time, that this life isn't all there is, or a sense that I'm special and unique. I've had this life, that life, this life, I'm special and unique. And then I start talking about it with people. I've had this, and they say, yeah, I've had this past life too. And all of those friends seem to you know, gather around me and they all had similar experiences. And now all of these experiences cause me to go down the track of, wow, this is really true. The truth of the universe. This is one of the truths of the universe. And, uh, and then I start telling that truth to others and teaching it. And I write books about it. And I document the thousands and thousands of past life experiences that everybody has had. And, and you know that one simple truth has just escaped my notice. And that is that it, these could all just be people in the spirit world in a different dimension connecting to me. That's what it could be. But all of that escapes my notice because I want to believe something different. That's where it all came from. And why do I want to believe something different? Because there is an emotional pathway inside of myself that allows me to not look at the simple logical truth that could be presented. Right? So I reject that out of hand. And I get, and, the, and this is the key, I get angry and resentful to anybody who suggests such a thing. And that's a very big sign that actually there's the emotional pathway of error that's allowing it to occur. Because you see, if I get angry and resentful about somebody suggesting it, then I have some deep emotional reasons why I want to retain it. And if I have deep emotional reasons why I want to retain it, then that obviously would mean that I want to believe this belief. And then that raises a whole, whole set of confusion within us. We go, wow, that means I could have an emotional set of belief inside of myself that allow me to be deluded that God exists. And that is dead true. You could. So how do I determine the truth? So then I get into this state, I can't believe anything then. <laughs> <laughs> and I get into this terrible state of confusion and everything else. And we're forgetting a couple of major points. And that is this. 
this construction that is constructed in our soul has been constructed because error has become truth inside of us. Error is always painful at the core level. And we're always trying to avoid the painful feeling of the painful core emotion. And that's what allows these errors to, avoid, to, to be constructed. If I try something different instead, what I try to do instead is I allow all of my emotions, including the painful ones, to pass through me. Then let's see whether I still have the same belief. Right? This is an experiment that anybody on this planet can do, is it not? They don't even have to believe in God or anything. They can do this. Yeah? I think, for me, there's an important thing here. First, we have to be given the option of what the truth is, which... That, well, that's what you think. But that's not true, actually. You see, when we're willing to experience all emotions, what happens is this. A unique thing happens we start generating these other pathways in our soul. Then instead of being a very mixed up, jumbled mess, if you like, that's going on inside of us, right? there's these very simple and direct pathways that get constructed in our soul that are due to new beliefs. And it goes like this instead. Right? Where the emotion can pass through without huge amounts of impedance anywhere throughout the soul. And so what then happens is that we are easily able to accept truth because the, the frank truth is, is that absolutely everything in the universe with regard to truth is easy to actually find. The only reason why it's hard for us right now to find is because we have a predisposition emotionally to error. Let me illustrate this. Flowers are lovely, aren't they? Yeah. Plants are an amazing thing. They tell us a lot about the universe, right? A lot more than most of us are aware, in fact. Right? Did you know that every plant is constructed generally upon mathematical rules? Right? So many of you know that. Now, if, if a plant's constructed around mathematical rules, wouldn't it make sense then that somebody had to create the rule? Now, let me put this in another way. You all believe that your car was manufactured by intelligence, don't you? Or well, sometimes the intelligence <laughs> may be doubtful, depending on how polluting the car is. But you all believe that. So you sit outside and you marvel your new car. Let's say, for me, back in the days when I was really addicted to, uh, let's call it material progression, I was, I was always picturing ma marveling my new Lamborghini. Right? And so eventually I got a different sports car that I could afford instead of a Lamborghini. But eventually I was going to marvel my new Lamborghini. But anyway, you're sitting there and you're marveling your new vehicle. You know how you get that emotional attachment that goes on between you and your vehicle? For those of you who have ever had the pleasure of bu buying a new one in particular, that would have happened at some point. So you're marveling your new vehicle and it just crosses your mind that somebody had to make it. Right? How many parts are in that vehicle? Does anyone know how many parts are in an average car? There's tens of thousands of parts in an average car. Anyway, so, so you, you, you marvel that somebody had to design every single one of those parts and create every single one of those parts. And you know, with most of those parts, if they're not designed within a certain tolerance, the whole thing won't work. Right? So in other words, you get a piston and you design it at just a fraction bigger than it should be, the whole car won't even start. Right? And instead what it will do, like you'll get these great big scores down marks down it and it'll be ruined the moment that it starts. And it won't, and it'll be useless. And so everything had to be designed with all this intricate, intricate complexity and all put together. Right? 
and all put together by somebody and manufactured by somebody and often it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that have actually designed it, put all these things together. And you know, we look at that car and we say, man, mankind is a marvel really, isn't it? And I, I feel this is the case. We are a marvel in a way that we can create such intricate things and a car is actually not very intricate compared to many other things. But we can create something that actually works and actually does a job and it's all had to come through design and lots of people getting together, lots of mathematics, lots of physics, lots of laws of chemistry, all these different things had to be known for that particular thing to be created. And we sit there, we marvel at the car and at the same moment we are in our body which is far more complex in its design than the vehicle and we're looking at a tree behind the car that maybe has a flower on it like this which is far more complex than anything that man has ever created, just that, right? Far more complex and it's alive. <laughs> Amazing that, right? <laughs> and then we say, isn't evolution such a wonderful thing? Right? And yet when we look at the car, do we say, isn't evolution such a wonderful thing? Or do we say, isn't mankind such a wonderful thing? being able to create those things. You see, what we're doing is we have predisposed ourselves emotionally to deny God, to deny God's creations. And in that state of predisposing ourselves to deny God's creation, we're actually forgetting some really basic things. And that is that God's creation tells us everything about God. And you are actually living in a universe and living on a world that you could learn everything about God, right the way down to soulmate relationships, all of these other truths that you've heard. You, if you look at creation now and you just examine it, you'll find that every single thing that you've learned from me, you would have been able to learn about God just by looking at creation. Right? That's the truth. So what causes us to be predisposed to not do that? Only our emotion. So right around us, right around us in the universe that we have today, we have everything able to be discovered. How do you feel, how do you think I discovered these truths that I'm telling you? Like, how did that happen? because I looked at the universe in which I was living and I got rid of the emotions that prevented me from understanding the truth about it. Does that make sense? Way back in the first century, that's what I did. And if we have a microphone. So AJ, does that mean that all of God's truths are already in us? And like with reincarnation, for instance, I always believed it, but when you told me that it wasn't, I was really accepting of that. And it was kind of like I already knew it and I was a little bit relieved almost. Yeah, this is the thing is we, we often hold on to emotions, that, or truths that we believe are truths through our fears. But when we're told the truth, often the truth can enter us quite quite easily as long as we don't have an emotional impediment for the truth to enter us. Does that make sense? Now the truth is that God created us to have these straight through pathways if you like. That's how God created us. And the truth creates these straight through pathways through our soul where we can instantly experience the truth of a certain subject. This is the beauty of receiving divine love. When you receive divine love the truth about something passes through you so rapidly because God's love expands your soul to a point where it's able to accept truth and it's only love in the end that causes you to be able to accept truth and it's only error or fear which is you could say the opposite of truth it's only that that causes you to accept unloving premises like God is a punishing God for example is an unloving premise but it, and it's only able to be accepted through my own negative and sad emotional experiences that I don't release from my soul. 
So the key for, you, for us to always remember is that all beliefs generally will be easily passing through us based on whether we have emotional impediments for them not or to pass through. Now in many of your cases, you've, some of these things were easily passed through you, some of the new truths that you've heard that you hadn't heard before easily passed through you because you had already prepared yourself emotionally for it in the one third of your life that you spent in the spirit world every day. In other words, you'd heard many of these truths in the spirit world but because none of them were yet on earth in the sense of being stated to you, you couldn't, you, you were in a state of confusion when you are on the earth. But as soon as you hear it, you go, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. Well, that makes so much sense because there's already a pathway open in your soul that you constructed open in your sleep state or in the state when you're in the spirit world, right, when you're asleep. And so many of you have these open pathways because of your investigations that you've already undertaken in the spirit world. And many of you also have a feeling that some of these emotions that you have holding on to self false beliefs are actually emotions that are harming you. And so many of you were automatically open to receiving more truth because of that. But what I'm discussing with you today is how your fears and emotions prevent these truths from being experienced in your life as emotional experiences. You see, what's happening a lot for us is that we hear the truth and it goes into this brain of ours and it resonates with this soul that's out, for a back there, out the back there that we've, we hardly feel most of the time. And it resonates and so we think, yeah, that must be true. I can, I, you know, that feels right to me, that feels true. But the truth is that while I have emotions within me that don't cause this belief to actually enter my soul completely, I will remain only in the intellectual state of belief. Now let's look at that. I believe God exists, let's say, based on our discussion there's a, and the different things that have happened to me, I believe God exists. And I believe there's an afterlife. And so I believe that there's a spirit world and that, that when I pass, I'll pass in the spirit world. So that's a belief. And I say to other people, yeah, no, I'm perfectly happy with dying, I'm fine with dying, okay. But then when my child dies, I have huge amounts of grief. Well, why does that happen? I'm saying to myself, and I feel within myself that I've got all of these beliefs that say that when you pass, nothing's happened really, and, that, you know, and yet I'm there grieving because my child's died. Why is, why is that? there must be an emotional impediment to me accepting emotionally the truth belief. Can you see that? Otherwise I wouldn't be crying, would I? Why would you be crying about something that can be a beautiful thing? Why would you be crying? I must believe it's not a beautiful thing. <laughs> At the soul level I must have an emotion within me that causes me to not feel that my child dying is a beautiful thing. And there must be an emotion and it must be an error-based emotion because it's not harmonious with what I even think to be the truth. Does that make sense? And this is the sets of beliefs that we need to confront. So the way we can confront them, the only way we can confront them is by having them as emotions inside of us. The truth has to enter us emotionally, not just as an intellectual idea. Right? It's not going to be the truth to you until it's entered you emotionally. It's just going to be an intellectual idea before that point. And Brian? Brian and Jim. AJ, going back a little, um, but it's tied in with this, I'm beginning to really see something about the, the way the soul's constructed and the pathways. It's, um, in my early life I was sent off to Anglican um, Sunday school yep. and couldn't see the truth in what I was being taught there so I just drifted away right. and um, the, the idea of God was, uh, was there intellectually but not real, not playing any real part. Um, if I went into nature, I, you know, for a long time my grandmother began teaching me this, I've been amazed and at the wonder of it, yeah. the absolute wonder of it. And I, I, I could see that the, it, 
it, it wasn't just evolution, there was some beautiful design in all this. Yep. I could see this in nature, in flowers, animals, everything else. It wasn't until I began listening to what you were saying that I applied that belief to myself. Yep. And it made a huge difference. Mm. And I'm now beginning to feel that um, there was a pathway created in, in that incident. Exactly, yep. And that's the beauty of this discovery process, is that when we discover the stuff that's in harmony with truth, it creates these quite open pathways, that when we actually finish up hearing the truth, it just goes, wow, that's right, no worries, <laughs> and bang, it accepts me. But not just here. It's not, wow, okay, here. It's, wow, okay, crying, tears, <laughs> all that kind of stuff, and the next day your life will be different. Mm -hmm. yep. That's the kind of shifts that you will make when the truth enters you in your heart emotionally. Yes, that's the way it felt. That's it, yeah. Jen? Um, I think Brian actually probably answered my question, but I'll ask it anyway. I find that what I can see and touch and understand mm -hmm. gets in the way of the more, for want of a better way of putting, etheric. Mm -hmm. So Brian's talking about what you can see and feel and touch in the real world and you talked about truth. But when it comes to death and dying mm -hmm. and the loss of people, I get stuck. Yet right. so I feel the celestials around. So I you're getting stuck on an emotion that's inside of yourself, that's all. This is the thing to see in the end. So, my, okay, I heard that, yep. <laughs> I think. Yeah. So um, you're getting stuck on so an emotion inside of yourself. So the key is to identify the emotion and really feel it. So okay. when, you, when you're out on the property the other day and the bulldozer went and bulldozed some <laughs> living <laughs> things down, yeah, let's do this, Jen, um, what happened to you is you went into grief. It was the gr this grief that was being triggered. Can you see that? And there's a resistance to that grief being triggered, so you ran away from the property so that you could get away from seeing the grief, seeing it being triggered in you. If you stay in the property and just let yourself feel the grief, you will connect to the emotion of what you feel about death. That's part of the process. You see, it's when we allow ourselves to experience the underlying emotion that the truth can then enter our soul. And what I want to do after our break, what is the time by the way? 3.10. Yeah, so we'll have a break in a minute. But what I want to do after our break is talk to everyone about how the truth, how you can actually allow this truth to emotionally enter your soul and how you can even trust that it's true. Because that's one of the biggest issues, right? How do I actually finish up trusting? If, if this emotional pathway can happen with any error and it happens all through my life, how can I then go ahead and trust that I'm actually receiving some truth right now? And there are different ways that we can use to start identifying how truth enters the soul as well. Right. Alex, just to... AJ, I just had a big realisation around reincarnation that I consciously chose to go down this um, eastern pathway because I wanted to avoid my fear of death. Yep. And reincarnation, the thought of reincarnation gave me that comfort zone. Exactly. Of, oh, I'll get another chance if I stuff this up. Exactly, yep. And, and actually, when you look at most human beliefs in most religions, right, you will see actually the same pattern, that the majority of beliefs have been created because of the emotions we wish to avoid in our living state. And that's the thing to take away with you for the break. Anyway, so we'll come back in about, about four-ish, shall we?